I want to spend a little bit of time talking about how to do validation and error handling inside of a happy server. So this is a basic framework for a happy server that uses the, uh, the vaccination models that we've been talking about. And uh, some things to point out here. One is that I'm bringing in a new module called Joy. Uh, this is, again, from the uh, heritage of happy from Ren and Stimpy, happy, happy, joy, joy. So Joy is a validation library that we can use to get uh, assistance, making sure that the information that's coming into our server through requests is properly formatted, contains the right information, and it, uh, it informs happy what we're expecting and if Happy finds that we're not getting a request that conforms to what our expectations are, what the validation information specifies, uh, it will reject that request for us and our code won't even be bothered. I've collapsed down some of the common things in this file here and I wanted to just focus on a few routes. So first of all, here's kind of my smoke test route. I usually include something like this in almost every server just so that I can get a basic sense for is it running, is it all hooked up, is it all deployed properly. Um, so the, uh, th this is something that you've seen before. Uh, the only thing that's new here is this options section. So this is a new attribute inside the route handler definition that can contain a whole variety of different things. I'd refer you to the happy documentation. But one of the things that we can put in here is a description. And this is just a simple string that tells us what this route is supposed to be used for. And I think I've included those descriptions in the options sections in the rest of these routes. Uh, maybe a more interesting one here is the, uh, the I'm going to kind of focus on the patients side of this little application. So our get method against patients is supposed to return all the patients, and that's what the description says. Again, the uh, route handler is quite simple. Uh, more interestingly is this route where we are asking for the information about a specific patient, so patients slash ID, and there's more information going on here in the uh, in the options section. First of all, we're also providing a description, retrieve a patient with the given ID, but then there's a new section here called validate. Now, we can validate a variety of different things in our request. Uh, in the same way that we can have uh, request.params that give us access to these kinds of things, and request.payload that allows us to access the payload of an incoming request, we can validate things either in that params section or in the payload section. And in this case, what we want to do is just make sure that when the user or the, the client software passes a request for the, the information on a particular patient, that that is a legitimate patient. Um, first of all, we want to check to see, is this formatted like a patient? Uh, if someone, uh, if a bad guy, for example, tries to issue an API request to slash patient slash slash patients slash foo, where foo is clearly not a valid identifier, um, we don't even want to be bothered with that. We just like hap happy and joy together to say, hey, that's just a completely bogus request. The syntax of this, the format of this is completely wrong. And that's what we're doing here in this validation section. So first of all, we're validating params. And again, params have to do with the things that are showing up as part of the URL. And within that params validation, we specifically want to validate the ID parameter. So to params, we pass a constructor called joy.object. And this is going to create a validation object that has some details in it about validating the contents of this params object. So its argument, uh, which has the curly braces here, notice that this schema here is actually just something that's coming from WebStorm. It's not actually in the code. Uh, but the schema is a, an object that configures this joy validator to know how to validate the request.params object. And the only thing that's in that request.params object for this route is that ID value. So we use the same identifier as the key to this object, and then we invoke some functions inside of joy. And these are designed to kind of cascade one into the other to give additional specificity to the kind of validation we're trying to do. So we can say joy.number, and that will tell joy to validate that that ID parameter is a number. But it might be a number like 4.2, which isn't a valid identifier in our database. So we can further qualify that by saying dot integer. And we can also say that we know because of the way the database creates these um, uh, serial values for our identifiers, uh, that they're always going to be at least one. And so we can specify a minimum value of one. Again, this limit colon thing is an artifact of the, uh, of the IDE. So 
If a request comes in to Happy and gets dispatched to this route handler, the first thing that Happy is going to do is say, hey, there's a validator for parameters. Let's check to see that all of these, all of these one, uh, actually passes validation. And if it doesn't, Happy is just going to immediately respond back to the client saying, hey, that's a malformed request, uh, and not even call our code. So we don't even have to worry about being invoked um, before we have our, before Happy has already verified that there is in fact an ID and that it has basically the right shape. It's it looks like an integer value that's at least one. So having accomplished that validation of the input, we want to take a little bit closer look at how we might want to do some validation on that data before we start sending responses back to the end user. Uh, in particular, we'd probably like to ensure that when we're asked for information about patient with a particular ID, that that patient actually exists. Uh, currently, uh, in the implementation we've looked at so far, if the patient doesn't exist, the uh, this happy server may well detect that there's a failure in the database query, and what gets sent back is going to be some generic 500 error that says that the server didn't know how to handle this request. Um, we'd like to be able to be more communicative about that. So, for example, if the uh, end user or an, an, another API client tries to request something that doesn't exist, a patient that doesn't exist, that we can actually give back a reasonable message like, sorry, this patient doesn't exist. And that would allow the, say, the user interface designer to create a message back to the end user saying, sorry, you gave us a bogus, a bogus value for this. The... Um, the way we're going to do that then is adding some code in the handler. So here's a, a simple version of code that takes care of that problem. We're going to um, do a query on the patient model, patient.query, where the, uh, the ID is equivalent to request.params.id. So that's just the value that we got passed in here when we were invoked. Uh, and then we're also going to do the with graph fetch to give the vaccines and the uh, company that produced the vaccine. Now, it's possible that if this ID value, although it could be completely legitimately formatted as an integer, uh, it might not actually correspond to a patient ID. In that case, what's going to come back here is a result set that is empty. Um, so what we want to do before we just go ahead and return that empty result set back to the, to the uh, client and indicating that it's actually a successful response, we want, to we want to switch things up a little bit to say, hey, sorry, we couldn't find this thing um, instead of just sending an empty list back to the, uh, to the client. So we're going to have some logic in here that just checks. Is the results length other than one? That's what we expect, right? Because we're querying against the table using a primary key. So either we're going to get exactly one value back or we're not going to get any values back if the where clause doesn't select any rows. So if it's other than one, we want to return an error message. On the other hand, if it is exactly one, we want to return the zeroth element of that result set. Remember that this is always going to give us back an array of patient instances. Uh, and if uh, there's only one of those, we get an array of one thing. However, because this is an endpoint that's asking for a specific element of a collection, we don't want to give back an array that just has one thing. We want to give back that one thing. So we'll just reach inside of this single element array and return the zeroth one. Now, if uh, the uh, if the, res if the uh, response from the database is other than this, in this case, the only other possibility is that we're going to get zero things back, we want to tell the end user or the user interface that we, we don't have any of these things uh, that match this criterion. Uh, this is one of, the, one of the places where we can use this H argument that we've been passing into our route handlers but haven't been paying any attention to. This thing is what, what Happy calls the, the response toolkit, and it allows you to build up different kinds of responses other than the defaults that Happy normally returns. Remember that if we return a, a scalar value from a route handler, Happy will return that. If we return an object, it will return a JSON encoding of that object. If we return a promise, Happy will wait for the promise to resolve and then uh, apply one of the first two rules. But if we want to do something different than that, we can use this response toolkit that Happy just passes in as H. Uh, so that's what we're doing inside of this if, if statement. It, when, when we find that we get an empty list, we want to tell the end user that or tell the, tell the client that. So we're going to use H.response, and this is going to construct a Happy response object. 
Uh, we can provide additional information in that response here. Patient not found, and I'm filling in the ID of the patients that's not patient that hasn't been found again from request.params.id using the backtick syntax and the dollar curly uh, template literal syntax. Uh, so that will provide some payload in the response. We could pass an object here if we wanted to, and it would send back JSON and so forth. Uh, and then I also want to update the response code appropriately. So when we uh, want to tell the client that the request that they made corresponded to something that we couldn't locate, uh, we would send a 404 response. Uh, so this will send a 404 not found response containing this payload back to the, uh, back to the client. Otherwise, it will return the actual patient that was retrieved from the database. Notice also that because I'm using kind of inline logic here, um, I've, dis I've defined this to be an async await style um, uh, function. So again, it's a fat arrow function. Uh, here's the body of the function because there's more than one statement. We've got to return things explicitly. And we also have to declare it because we're using await here to wait for the query to complete. We've got to also declare that function to be async. So again, this, because this is a fat arrow function, we don't have the word function here, but we still have to tell JavaScript that this is an asynchronous function so that we can use the await inside. Let's look at another endpoint here uh, having to do with patients. We're going to look at the post request, which because we're sending it to a collection resource is going to create a new patient in this case. So again, we have this new options sections that is going to have our description, create a new patient, and then some validation. Now in this case, what we're trying to validate is not a parameter that's in the URL, but it's the contents of the payload that's being processed by this endpoint. And you'll remember that the payload for these patients contains the first name, the last name, and their phone number. And so we want to have a validator that checks to see that all those things are present in the payload of this request. So unlike the previous case where we were doing a validate against the params and looking at the ID param, here we're going to do a validate, but we're going to look at the payload. And that payload is going to contain more than one thing, right? we got to have a first name, a last name, and a phone number, all of which are required in order to be able to create a new patient. So again, we're going to use this joy.object because we want to validate an object. The object is going to be, in this case, the payload object that's going to come in as request.payload. And we want to validate three fields. So the first one is the first name field. And we're going to use, instead of a numeric validator, we're going to use a string validator. So we're saying this has to be a string. Uh, and it has to, be re has to be present. We can't create a new patient unless that field is there. So this dot required means that the joy validator will verify that there is, in fact, a first name attribute that has a string value and it's present in that object. We can also specify the uh, minimum length of the string. Uh, when we're talking about a numeric value, the min actually refers to a minimum value, but here for a string, it refers to a minimum length. So we're saying we have to have at least one character for our first name. I noticed that in the previous case, we didn't use the required uh, function or the required method when we were validating our, uh, our integer. Uh, the reason being that if there was nothing here, if that ID value was empty, Happy would never have dispatched the request to this route handler, right? Because this is defined to take an additional piece of information here. And if that's not present, Happy would probably have just given back um, a, a not found error message because we don't have any get requests defined on patients with no additional parameter. However, in this case, uh, there's nothing that's v v guaranteeing that any of these fields are present in the request payload. So we want to tell Happy, hey, make sure that there's a first name. And then the last name is, is exactly the same validator. We're also going to validate the phone number. And again, it's a string. It's required. We can't create a patient without it. And in this case, we're going to use a regular expression for validation. So this dot pattern method takes a regular expression. So here's a literal JavaScript regular expression that's three digits, a dash, three digits, a dash, and four digits. Now that's not a particularly robust pattern for phone numbers, 
Um, in some cases, you're not going to want to have the area code. Other people prefer to put the area code in parentheses. If we're dealing with international uh, calling, we've got to have a vastly different uh, approach to doing this. We might not be able to do a validator really uh, very sophisticated at all if we want it to be very general. So we're just assuming um, a 10-digit phone number in this case. But the point here really is just illustrate the use of a regular expression in the validator. So by the time um, we get called here by Happy, we will have ensured that the basic formatting of the payload in this request is at least syntactically reasonable. It's got all the right fields. It's got a reasonable take at the content of those fields to allow us to go ahead and send a request to the database. And the handler itself then is really quite simpler, right? We're just gonna do an insert query against the patient model and pass in the payload itself. So all three of these fields will be available to the insert. It'll add that new patient and we're done. All right, let's look at a patch request. Now in this case, think about what we're trying to do. The patch says, let's update a subset of the attributes of this underlying resource. And in this case, it's a, uh, an element resource, right? One of the elements of this collection that happens to have that ID value. Um, and it's gonna have to have, so it's gonna not only have to have a parameter in the URL, but it's also gonna have to have a payload that corresponds to the fields that we wanna have updated. So our options object is a little bit different than previously. Um, it includes a validator for both the parameters, in other words, this ID value here, as well as the payload, because you're gonna have both for a patch request. The validator for the for the ID parameter is exactly the same as we saw for the get request for patients slash ID, just verifying that it's an integer that has a minimum value of one and that it's you know present. But it, again, it's going to be present for sure, or we wouldn't have ever triggered this route handler. The payload is very similar to the case for the post request. However, because we want to allow the end user to kind of mix and match those fields that are being updated, we don't want to have these things all be required. In fact, we don't have any of those dot required fields in here at all um, so that the client software that's using this API could send just the first name or just the last name or the first and last name or just the phone number or in fact could in principle re re, uh, request changes to all three of these fields. But we don't know what the combinations that are going to be valid are in advance. So we're just basically saying here, if there's a first name, it's gotta match this validator. If there's a last name, it's gotta satisfy this validator and so forth. I guess you could argue that if you have an empty payload that we shouldn't ever bother to talk to the database, and that might be um, something else that you could add to, to, your, uh, to your verification, because none of these fields are marked here as required, in fact, an empty payload would also be validated as far as happy and joy were concerned. So it's not completely airtight, but if we have any of those values, we're at least sure that they have a feasible value. Okay, so now we're going to uh, verify, before we try to go do an update to this, uh, to this uh, patient object, we're gonna verify that it actually exists. Again, I've defined this. You could use promises and then and catch and stuff if you if you prefer, but I've defined this to be um, an async function so I can use a wait and have more uh, imperative-like code inside of the, the body of the request handler. Um, so fat arrow function again, so I just see async without the word function in here. And it's basically two steps. Verify that the patient is present. If not, send back an error message and then do the update. So again, I'm saying await in order to wait for this query to settle down before moving on to the next step of the algorithm. Uh, patient.query, I'm using a different, um, a, a different function here to look up the patient. So instead of saying dot where ID comma request dot params that ID, uh, objection supports this kind of convenient shortcut, find by ID, which is a sensible thing for objection to have because for the most part, everything that's known about or everything that's known in a in an objection application, all the models are going to have some kind of an ID field associated with them. So this is a convenient shortcut that basically just does where the ID equals this value. Um, and then that's going to come back with either a single instance of the patient because we're asking for the ID, which is the primary key, or nothing, 
So we're going to await the return value from that. And if that return value is falsy, right, I've got an exclamation point here to do logical negation. If this doesn't come back with anything, we want to send an error response. And it's exactly the same response that we saw previously uh, that's going to say, sorry, this patient with that ID doesn't exist. And that would be a 404 because the client had requested something that's not found. On the other hand, if we do get a patient back from this, we can continue to go ahead and update that patient. So again, patient.query, I'm using find by ID again as a convenient shorthand, and the appropriate function to call, or a convenient function to call in objection is called dot patch. That's gonna basically update those fields that are listed in the request payload. And importantly, the way that that's defined is it allows you to have an arbitrary subset of the fields in this patient model, uh, and it will only update those fields. So if I only pass a first name in the request or only pass a phone number in a request, this patch function or method will, dis will define a SQL update statement that only updates those fields that were mentioned in the, in the payload. All right, let's look at another example here. This is a post request to patients, patient ID, vaccines, vaccine ID. So the idea here is that we're gonna add this vaccine or the vaccine with this vaccine ID to the patient with this patient ID to say that this person has received this vaccine. Um, we've got two parameters in the URL. So we're gonna have a validator that uses params. And in this case, we've got two two values that are going to be stored in that params object by happy when we get called. So we've got two validators in here, one for PID and one for VID. And then the, the uh, validator itself is just like we saw before. It's going to be a number, it's got to be an integer, and it's going to be at least a value of one. Again, if the, uh, the client sends us something that doesn't look like patients slash a number slash vaccines slash a number, the validator will fail and our handler function won't even be called. Happy will just respond on our behalf to say, sorry, that's not a valid request that I know how to deal with. So once, it, once we get into the handler function, we can at least be reasonably sure that PID and VID are both integers of at least a value of one. Now, before we make the association between this patient and this vaccine, we wanna verify that those are actual things. So. Uh, we've got an, another conditional similar to the previous example where I'm querying the database to see does there exist a record in the patient model class that corresponds to the patient ID? If not, then send back a response that says, sorry, this patient wasn't found. Similarly, I want to make sure that the vaccine that we're trying to associate with that patient is something that actually exists in the database. So again, vaccine.query find by ID, and then I'm looking for the vaccine ID. And if I don't find it, I send back an error message. Another thing that I want to verify here is that this patient has not already been associated with this vaccine. If I try to insert into the, um, into the vaccination record, uh, a redundant entry, I'm going to get an error message back from the database because of the way that that thing's been defined, where the vac vaccination uh, has both the vaccine ID and the patient ID as part of a composite primary key. So if I try to put the same values in for those fields in a new row, the database will freak out. So I want to check to see, do I already have that? So here's that request. Now I've chosen in this case to use the, the vaccination uh, model class. If you didn't define a vaccination model class, that's fine. You don't have to do it this way. You could you could use the uh, other mechanisms of creating a, a manual join here to fish out the particular values. This just seemed like a convenient way to deal with it. So I'm going to say vaccine or vaccination.query and now I can't just use like find by ID because that just takes a single value. Uh, I've got to do a real where clause. So and I'm using the variation of where clause that allows me to pass an object here where the key of the entry, key of each entry is the name of the field and the value is the value I'm looking for and it will create an equality comparison for patient ID and vaccine ID and turn those things into a single where clause joining those two together with an and. So that's just the default behavior because that's the common case. There's more elaborate and more explicit ways of passing this in from objection but this is a simple way to do it. 
So vaccinations is going to get back the list of values that uh, that have this patient and this vaccine. Um, again, I'm not I'm because I'm always going to get a result set back. I'm not using like the dot first function or anything like that. Uh, this is going to be an array. It may have only one entry or it may have zero entries because these two uh, column names are part of the composite primary key. So if that list is or has a length that's greater than zero, that means that this particular combination of patient and vaccine is already in the database, and I don't want to try to duplicate that. So I just say patient such and such is already tr receiving vaccine such and such, and then send back a 400 request. Now notice in these cases I sent 404s, which is a not found, basically saying, hey, I don't know anything about vaccine, whatever the number is for the VID. In this case, though, it's not really that I didn't find it. I did find it. It's just that uh, I can't do anything with that request because it's already present in the database. So I send a 400, which basically means bad request. All right. So if we've got through all of those different validation steps, now we can create the association between that um, patient and that vaccine. So I'm going to use the, I could use the vaccine vaccination record again and just post into it, but I'm using the, um, the related query approach in, in this case. I'm kind of crossing the streams here a little bit using, using the vaccination in one place and not in the other, but I want to illustrate both. So patient.related query to vaccines. I'm trying to do a new relationship between the patient with, with uh, this primary key PID and relate it to the vaccine that has the primary key VID. And then when I'm all done, I'm just going to send that value back as my response. I could also just as simply have returned data and that would have been encoded appropriately by happy and sent back to the, to the uh, client. Okay, so for all of your routes in your uh, API server, you want to do, use these techniques. Do the validation of parameters and payload. There's other validators that are available to you, but those are the common ones. And then also think through how to check for problem cases like missing IDs and duplicate primary keys and that kind of stuff. Uh, and head those off at the pass before you try to make a change to the database or do any other activity related to processing that RESTful API endpoint. And use that as an opportunity to return a rich and useful and meaningful error response back to the client uh, if any of those uh, errors are present. That will allow you to display useful messages to the end user or if you're using the API from another piece of software to be able to process those requests in a, in a meaningful way and respond accordingly depending on whether you got error conditions or if everything worked okay and you got back a nice 200 error code.